Would you like to learn how people are playing against 1d6 in 2023? And would you also like to learn how to beat these most common responses that your opponents are likely to make? Hey everybody, I am Grandmaster Max Sillingworth, and in the year of 2023, I have been playing the move d6 quite a lot in my online games on chess.com, not just against e4, but also against some other moves such as d4 as well. You'll see in the chess.com explorer, which I'm using now, that I have a lot of games with this, and also playing d6 in quite a lot of different ways. So I'm very confident that by the end of this video, you're going to find a system within d6 that will be to your liking, and that you'll be ready to play in some of your games. Uh, also, do make sure to support the channel, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Now, after e4, d6, what's the most common line is at the top level and what you'll face most often is going to be d4, knight f6, and knight c3. There is another approach we'll see a bit later that you will also face a lot among some less experienced players. But this is really where we have our first crossroads, where I've tried a lot of different options from here. The most common one is the Peerage Defense with G6, where we go for a Kingside Fianchetto. I'll also show you a bit of how some Lion-style approaches with playing for the E5 break work in true course. But let's start with the Peerage, because that's the line I've been playing the most often in my games for this year. With the idea being that, well, we're just going to develop our Bishop, castle our King, and then look for a good way to counterattack the center. Now, the line I'm showing you here with bishop c4 and castles is the one I face the most often in my games. And let me ask you, what would you play in this position if you were black here? And I'll give you a little bit of a hint as well that we do have a small tactic available in this position. So who here knows about the fork trick? So the fork trick is a line that happens within e4, e5 where in that version you play the move knight takes e4, they take the knight, and it turns out you didn't just blunder a knight, because you have d5 to fork the knight and bishop and get your piece back. And if we play out this position, say bishop d3 takes and takes, which I have had in a couple of my games, you'll notice that white doesn't have two pawns side by side in the center anymore. We achieved our primary goal of destroying the white center and we can actually destroy the white center even more where move like knight d7 followed by the move c5 hitting back in the center which I believe i actually did this in a game against mag 33 where i went c5 was able to just destroy their center with exchanges and you know if they take with the pawn they get stuck with an isolated queen's pawn that we're going to be able to attack about pieces later but if they play knight d4 as my opponent did in the game, well, then they don't have a pawn in the center while we still have a central pawn alive, which gives us quite a, a comfortable position from here. Uh, also, another thing you might notice is that it's very hard for them to really attack our king in these kind of middle game positions because this is just a really solid formation around our king. In fact, if they do want to attack our king, the main way they'd go about it would be to play something like bishop to e3, and then to build this queen and bishop battery with queen d2. Intending to go bishop h6, trade off our bishop, and start an attack with h4, h5. So you might be wondering what exactly should we do about this here. The good news is there are a few plans we can play to try to deal with this. For example, one of the main plans is to go c6 here. And then when they play to move bishop to h6, we can go for counterplay on the queen side with b5 where we're already threatening to play b4. And then when a knight moves, we can take that pawn on e4 for free. And if they defend when move like bishop d3, well, in that case, I played the move b4 in a game from this position and went on to win against Penguin Chocolate. But I think if I had this position again, I'd probably go bishop g4, with ideas of potentially doubling their pawns with bishop f3 and then hitting back in the center with e5. Uh, it's something important we should really understand when we play these kind of modern systems and period systems that even though we haven't put a pawn in the center we're playing a hyper modern system it doesn't mean that we're never going to put a pawn in the center it just means that 
is going to be a little bit delayed in comparison. So let's say, for instance, if we played knight c6, which is also a plan that I've done a few times as black. Well, after bishop h6, it's kind of a nice point that here you can play this move of b5, which I find to be one of the more thematic ways to deal with this bishop h6 plan. Uh, kind of the argument here is that when they take on g7, which is consistent with playing bishop h6, well, we don't have to worry so much about our bishop being stuck behind the pawn chain anymore because we already traded the bishop, right? And meanwhile, we have ways to undermine their center with moves like c6. We could also play f5 in some positions, uh, especially if they've castled short something like this, then you're know, definitely going for f5 and the kingside pawn storm. It's certainly a lot more appealing in this version where you kind of have a good king's Indian where white would, wish, would really wish he had the pawn on c4 so that he can go c5 and try to attack the base of our pawn chain. But because the knight is blocking c4, he can't really do that so easily here. So you can see how there are some similarities between this modern, uh, this uh, Pirates defense that we see here, and also the King's Indian, where let's say if I had played d4 and, you know, let's say after c4 that we decide to transpose back into a King's Indian defense with g6, you know, you can see how you get a somewhat similar kind of position here. Uh, I will show you a bit later, you're not limited to transposing back into another opening. There are definitely some independent options for black that you can also go for here. But if you have some existing experience with the King's Indian defense, then that's probably going to be a little bit of an advantage in getting a good feel for these positions a bit faster than otherwise. Um, nice thing also about d6 is there isn't a whole lot of opening fury attached to it. So you can definitely pick up the ideas relatively quickly and, you know, you're unlikely to lose the game just because you forgot some critical move on move 18 or something. Now, going back to this position with the Pirates, it's also worth pointing out that while you're going to face knight f3 in, not to say the majority of your games, but the most common move you'll face, there are definitely some other approaches that white can go for as well. Uh, for example, you can play the move f4, the Austrian attack, which is often associated with trying to push in the center with a move like e5 in the, not just the middle game, but even potentially in the opening. There are a few different responses you can go for from here, where one of the main plans after, say, castles and bishop d3 is to go knight c6 and try to push in the center with e5. Uh, for example, a point worth noting is that after e5, that it might appear that you're losing the pawn here because you're going to, <clears throat> well, white's attacking it three times, black's only defending it twice. However, after takes takes, you might notice that if white does play d takes c5, we have this move of knight g4 that allows us to regain the pawn in the absolute worst case scenario here, because we have three attackers, they only have one defender of e5. It also turns out you can even just play knight takes e5 directly with a little trick in mind. Um, so you might be wondering what if white just takes a knight for free? Well, it's not for free because we have queen d4 and we regain the piece with this fork. And we actually have a very nice structure here as black after bishop f4 and let's say queen c5. You can see that white has an isolated pawn on e4. We can very easily develop the bishop with tempo. Or we could even put our knight on the e5 outpost as well, just blockading that e4 pawn as a target. And white can't easily attack our king because it's just defended very well by our bishop and knight and pawns. So we can see here that white's not really able to, if I just fast forward a little bit, the weird thing with the chess.com, it doesn't let you uh, click on the move anymore. It's a glitch that they generally fix. Like if I click on a move, it'll just go back to the starting position. Uh, but I also want to show that one option I've been sort of experimenting with in 2023, which has virtually no theory to it, which I think will surprise your opponents a bit, is the move knight to c6 where you're basically kind of accelerating this idea of playing e5, or let's say if they go bishop d3, you can go bishop g4 and kind of put some faster pressure on the white center than usual. It's a project if you're a master player, it's probably not going to work that well, because, for example, some moves like uh, d5 can be a little bit annoying, where you end up you know, losing some control of the center. Although even here I had a game actually against uh, Pablo DMP on chess.com, 
or was able to go c6 and you know kind of mess up his structure and you know probably white's a little bit better objectively but you have a very clear plan of putting pressure on d5 and you know white doesn't find it so easy to defend the pawn with a pawn of his own the pieces will be a little bit tight to defense this pawn in the long term which kind of makes up for black space disadvantage here so you can sort of see how even if they play d5 in this version it's actually still not all that scary for for black um and meanwhile we do have a clear plan to just piling the pressure on d4 with our pieces and pawns and even trying to benefit from you know delaying castling by yeah having that faster pressure against d4 and so forth so if we go back why can also play other moves like bishop to g5 is another one i've seen quite a bit where white will often again be trying to get this pressure with bishop to uh, h6 and trying to get a fast attack even before we castle but one difference having the bishop on g5 compared to e3 is that we can play the move h6 and sort of ask white where his bishop's going here because if he goes bishop h4 we can play the move g5 and basically win the bishop pair. There is more theory from this point, but you, know, you can definitely go for this very solid hippo style setup where having the bishop pair does more or less ensure you're going to be objectively okay and such. Uh, so that's a fairly easy counter to bishop g5. Also moves like bishop d3, you know, you can just develop quite normally and if they play knight f3, you can castle and bishop e3. Again, there are a lot of good plans for black, but, you know, both c6 and pushing for on the queen's side, and knight c6 and hitting back in the center, like, both of these plans are going to be absolutely fine for black. You know, once again, you can see that after d5, knight e7, that we get this good king's Indian, where white is not able to get his usual queen side play that he would desire, due to that knight on c3, you know, blocking the, the c pawn. So not a very harmonious sub for white. Now, let's say if you want to play d6, but you don't want to go for a kingside fianchetto. You want to play it a little bit differently. The good news is you do have a few other options available here. The most common of these is to play the move e5. And you might be wondering what if white just takes and just trades the queens so that black loses right to castle. Well, it turns out this endgame is actually not so bad for black here. Because your king being in the center is not such a big deal when the queens are off, right? And after knight f3, bishop d6. If they do play bishop g5, which is the move I face the most often here, uh, quite a good reply here is actually just to play a move such as bishop e6. Uh, in my own games, I was playing knight bd7, but I'm not such a big fan of that move anymore. I think you actually don't mind if the, if the pawns get doubled. Just bear with me as I... Play the moves just so you can see uh, see how it plays out. So knight three, bishop d6, bishop g5, bishop e6. So it turns out the dull pawns are actually not such a big problem. Because A, you have the bishop pair to compensate for it. And B, you're going to be able to play f5 in the middle game to trade off the double pawn and just have that nice uh, bishop pair advantage to work with. Uh, of course, white has alternatives. You know, they can castle here as well. But then knight bd7 works a bit better when we're not blocking in the bishop anymore. And if they do play something like knight b5 trying to use their lead in development. It turns out we actually don't mind the exchange of our bishop. We get this kind of knight off structure where we've got some pressure against e4. We've got some counterplay down the c file. So it's really not so bad for black at all here. The other main option that you're definitely going to want to know something about is if they play the move bishop c4 which is something I have faced a bit. And the good news is you have a few different options available where the most solid one is probably just to play the move king e8 and just to develop sort of quietly as I did in one of my more recent games where after castles and I played the move knight c6 here but it's probably better to go c6 and just kind of dominate the knight on c3 with your pawn. You'll be able to grab space on the queen side with b5 and a5. You can kind of develop your knight to d7 from there. So it's a very harmonious sub where I don't think black has any particular problems. Partly due to white not being able to easily use this lead in development and his knights being a little bit stuck in this structure. Uh, there are other approaches. Also bishop b4 is a quite active alternative for those of you who want to be a little bit more ambitious. Uh, nice point is that 
they're not just winning a pawn with bishop f7 because we are able to take on e4 and regain the pawn thanks to the pin uh, that's why we put the bishop on b4 earlier and if they do play a move like f3 which i did face in a game against frederick 91 well in that case you can play the move king e7 you know without having to block your bishop in on f8 and we're able to play bishop e6 trade off the bishops and then we're just going to keep improving the position c6 knight d7 push the queen side pawns definitely if you like end game positions if you really love end games i would certainly recommend that you play the move e5 but if you don't like end games you may prefer to play the lion move order with knight bd7 instead with that idea, you're able to sort of head towards the hanham philidor as this line is known but where you don't allow the exchange of queens because if they play d5 which is the move i normally faced well then you can take with a pawn there's no exchange of queens if bishop c4 there's really a host of different bishop developments you can go for here in the past i normally would play bishop to b4 or just put the bishop on the usually seven square anyway but recently i kind of like this bishop c5 as a nice active way to get the bishop out um bishop b4 does have the advantage that you are putting pressure on the e4 pawn which in my experience a lot of your opponents aren't going to deal with particularly well because that can certainly be a dangerous weapon then you might look like to look into yourself and try out in some of your own games the move you'll face the most often against good players like i face d5 most often in my own games which is a little bit surprising to me but if you're playing more advanced players you can expect to see bishop c4 and you know more of this kind of stuff like castles castles and there's a lot of theory here while i try and dive deep into but the main plan normally is to go for some sort of dark squared strategy let's say a move like a5 You'll often play moves like queen c7, h6, rook e8, just kind of putting the piece on good squares. And, you know, at the right moment, you're often going to play a move such as e takes d4. Um, so this is following a game I played against a uh, against Pablo DMP, where we end up getting this position. And it sort of just shows kind of what black is trying to do in these sorts of, uh, these sorts of structures, where, you know, you can play bishop f8. You know, at the right moment, you'll take on d4. Put your knight in the center to free the bishop and you know you'll have a pretty solid position with no real weaknesses so there are of course a lot of different plans white can go for you know white also could have you know played some other ways but it gives you an idea of what black at least is where he's putting the pieces in terms of the middle game and there are also a few other moves like there are also some sidelines like c6 is a a kind of interesting alternative to check defense if you wish to reduce your theoretical workload um the idea of c6 is not just to prepare this but also you can go bishop g4 and play in a, a very sort of systematic way where you just play you know normal developing moves you just develop the king side uh so bishop g5 castles and in this game my parent checked me later played bishop f6 and gave up the bishop pair for no reason but let's say if they did play a move like queen d2 here well, what do you think would be Black's middle game plan in this sort of structure? So here, what we're going for, and by the way, this is also what we're playing if Y had gone for a different sub, say, with Bishop E3 or Rook E1 or even with G4 at some point. Our plan would be pretty much the same, that we're going to play D5. And this next move kind of shows why we didn't rush to play Knight BD7 a bit earlier which might have seemed like a very natural developing move to you. Well, it's so that we could play knight f to d7, keeping the square retreat square available for the knight, so that in a position like this, uh, let's just say I play rook a1 or rook f1 for the argument's sake, so that in this position we can go c5, knight c6, and we're really going to be applying a lot of pressure against the d4 and e5 pawns. In fact, we're already threatening to win the pawn on f d4 with bishop f3 and knight takes d4 but on the other hand if they play d takes c5 we can see that now the pawn on e5 is coming under attack from all of our minor pieces which makes it not so easy for white to keep his pawn safe in this position so that's kind of what we're aiming for when we play c6 and it's true that you know if we go back to the earlier moves that you know white's not limited to play knight f3 like there are moves like f4 as well but you'll probably face knight f3 the most and 
one nice thing as well about having this c6 bishop g4 system in your arsenal as a very systematic approach is that you can also play it after knight f3 there's something i faced quite a lot recently with my opponents playing knight f3 and then knight c3 like you can play to move bishop g4 and actually go for a very similar setup to what we just saw there we'll have to say d4 uh c6 would be a direct transposition to the the check defense by the way but in my own games, I've more often played the move order with e6 and kind of just played it just developing the king side first, say bishop e3, castles. And then at this point, I would play, well, let's test your, your memory. Let's just not give it away. But what do you think might be a more useful move than c6 in this position for black? So well done if you realize that the move d5 is to play here. Now, if they play e takes d5, you actually could take either way. You could make an argument for either the knight recapture or the pawn recapture here. You know, the, this will kind of lead to an exchange French where the extra move bishop e3 doesn't really help all that much for white because the position is just so quiet. But knight d5 leads that more unbalanced structure, you know, where you can try to put some pressure on the d4 pawn. You've got a bit less space, but because all your pieces are finding good squares, it's not really that big of a deal here. And if they do play e5, well, then you can go knight fd7 and, again, have that familiar pressure where you basically have a good French defense where instead of your bishop being stuck on c8 inside the pawn chain, it's out on g4, pinging the knights and sort of playing a role in pressuring the white center indirectly by attacking one of the key defenders of the, of the uh, d4 points and the e5 square. So that's really the, a nice idea to work with the knight c3. Of course, after this, you could still play the moves we've seen before. Like, you could still play g6 and, you know, transpose into the appearance. You could still play e5 and transpose back into the lion slash Han and fill it all with knight bd7. Uh, this is a good moment to point out, by the way, that one advantage of playing the 3 5 move order is you do also get the option of the Antishin fill it all with bishop e7, uh, which is a bit more of a passive approach, but if you want to just play it as a system and not have to learn too much opening theory this could be a potentially an appealing option also i noticed that very few players have really at all prepared for it for example the best move here for white is bishop f4 followed by castling long but actually only three of my 14 opponents have played this way uh which is not a big number as such going back though just thinking if there are any other systems i should mention uh weirdly enough i've actually faced the move e5 quite a lot in my games but it's pretty easy to deal with. You just trade off the knights. You kind of play a normal plan and you know, just get a very comfortable position. So it's not really anything special to worry about. Uh, if they play d3, it's kind of a, a nice point that a little move order trick for those who have some experience with the Sicilian can be to go c5 and actually transpose into a, a close Sicilian, but where white's not really play one of the more critical approaches. You know, a good approach for those who who... Maybe you don't have so much experience in the Sicilian. You can just play g6 and you know, still get a position kind of in a similar spirit to the Pierce defense, where your middle game plan is going to be go rook b8, expand on the queen side with pawns. Um, also, if they do play for bishop h6 again, the e5 is kind of a nice reply just to be able to, you know, put your pawns on the dark squares when you're not going to have a dark squared bishop anymore, uh, kind of like this. And also their white's bishop and piece are pretty passive as well in this structure, which helps. So those are a few ideas you can work with with e4, d6. Just think if there are any other systems I should mention. You know, I guess that something that you will see every now and then will be, you know, white trying to play it like a Grand Prix attack with f4. And in these cases, most of the time I actually just play to move c5 and transpose into a Sicilian. You know, I've got a lot of experience in these positions. I'm fairly comfortable playing this sort of thing as black. If you don't have so much experience playing the Sicilian, well, you could always play a move like g6 and just play it like a Pierce is definitely an option here. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that, you know, after bishop g7, if they do play bishop c4, you know, you can, you know, play quite creatively where you can play like c6 and push in the center, for instance, to play it in a bit more of an independent way. And you could also play some move like bishop g4, for instance, and, you know, just revert back to that sort of French-style e6 and d5 plan that I mentioned before. 
So that's not too much to be afraid of, but this is a weapon I have played a bit as white, so it's worth knowing that, you know, the systems they can play against Sicilian can also be played against D6, and, well, as you face them more and more often, you'll get more comfortable with dealing with them as such. I also want to have a quick look at... Actually, before I move on, there is one other point I will mention that, that escaped my mind. You can also play to move G6 here and transpose back into the modern... But there's no sort of independent advantage really to doing so, you know, compared to playing 1g6. But the option is there for those who, let's say, who are playing 1g6 and you know, want to add 1d6. This would be a relatively easy, you know, sort of go-to in that respect. And it's sort of funny because actually back in 2021 and 2022, I was actually playing g6 as one of my main weapons as black, which might be a reason I feel quite comfortable in the d6 positions because of the similarities, you know, between the Pirates and the modern. But anyway... Let's also have a quick look at what can happen if they play d4 here, and we then play the move d6, which I have played in 226 games on chess.com at the time of recording, so I've built up a fair bit of experience. Now, you can sort of divide white's options really into two main categories. Um, now, we're going to exclude e4, because we already looked at this via the 1e4 move order. But the main options are either to play c4 and play it in the Queen's Gambit style, or to play some system opening, maybe with knight f3, maybe with bishop f4, or, or e3. And actually, funnily enough, I face the second approach more often than the first one. But I'm going to start with c4 just because it's the most critical move. And once again, you may be happy to just play a move like knight f6 and, you know, just transpose into an old Indian. That's definitely a legitimate approach and, you know, one that I've been doing a bit lately. But for this video, I'm going to focus more on an approach known as the rat, which is where we really show the independent value of the move 1d6 as a way to avoid fury but still get a reasonable position. So the first point of e5 is again we're not afraid of d take c5. In fact this ends up being a much better version of the end game than the one we saw with 1e4 because in this version we have a space advantage with the pawn on e5 and if they do play a move such as e4 here the problem for them is that the d4 square becomes a long-term weakness uh, maybe we won't necessarily rush to play knight c6, knight d4. We probably will want to consolidate the position, like get the king to c7, knight d7, this kind of thing. But at some point, we will be able to maneuver our knight towards d4 in the middle game. That weakness is not really going away. And white isn't really in a position to make use of their space advantage. So it's really a position of advantage is actually better for black at this stage. Certainly on a practical level, black is scoring very, very well from this position in practice. Um, it is true they don't have to play e4, but you can still put the pieces on the same squares in general and just sort of nurse that space advantage through the end game. So really d5 is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, funnily enough, the move I actually face the most often here is the move knight to c3, which was actually my own preference as white as a junior. But then after takes, we see that the white queen is going to come under fire uh, with knight c6. And actually, most of my opponents played queen d1 and just sort of let me get this nice king's indian structure. I did have a very recent game this year where I actually managed to defeat uh, one of the best star bullet players, Ray Robson. Where after queen d2, knight f6, this is how the game went against Robson. I played bishop e6. He probably should play to move e4 at this point and, you know, just sort of played in a kind of Marocci sort of style from there. But he decided to play the automatic bishop b2, completing the fianchetto. I suspect most of you who are watching this video will probably yeah, be facing either like e4 in this position and just some normal king's indian sort of position where the queen is not so great on d2 or you're going to face b3 followed by bishop b2. Uh, now I want to ask you what would be the move that you'd play here as black because this move really set the foundation for being able to win this game because actually in this match you know Robson was beating me most times so he's like 3100 bullets I'm only 2950 bullet currently. But this time I was able yeah, to catch him in a little bit of a trap. So well done if you realize that we want to trade off white central space advantage with the move of d5. In this way, we just really release the energy of our pieces. You know, we get our knight active. We can play bishop b4. We This is what happened in the game. That we pin the knights. And it's just really hard for white to get out of this pressure where... I think after a 3 I maybe didn't play it necessarily the very best way where, you know, the move of casting is definitely very much in the Morphe spirit, you know, sacrificing the the bishop but getting this really big attack. 
Um, it was a bit of an intuitive sacrifice, like I didn't calculate it all the way to checkmate. But you know, I kind of sensed around this point that this position should just be winning for black. Like if they play queen e2, you can even play like bishop takes b3 and you know, it's just very hard for white to get out of knight d3 or knight c2 here. Uh, in the game, it ended up being a bit more messy, but I was able to, you know, eventually win it as such. So that was, yeah, kind of a sort of inspirational game, if you like, with this, uh, with this uh, e5, d6, e5 idea. Uh, there are other moves you'll see, like d5 can lead to a more King's Indian type of structure. But you've got a few good options. You can go f5 and just sort of develop the king side like this. You know, it sort of gives you a King's Indian type of position but where your bishop is more active on e7, perhaps, compared to g7. Uh, plus, you're only spending one move to develop the bishop rather than two, which is quite nice. Uh, you can also play other plans, like a5 as a move I've been playing a bit, where you sort of just play to hold up the queen side, and maybe keep the option of, you know, playing g6, bishop g7, or even bishop e7, bishop g5, which is actually also kind of an interesting plan here, where you can go for, you know, a move like this, where you just trade off your bad bishop and... You know, playing a little bit more of a positional way compared to the, the more direct f5. So you can see that there's a lot of different playable moves in this position. Maybe white's a tiny bit better objectively with best play, but it's definitely a position where I have a lot of scope to outplay the opponent and we have a lot of reasonable choices at each juncture. Uh, finally, if they do play something like e3, you know, I usually just play f5 and you know, just go for this kind of Grand Prix attack with colors reversed. Once again, I'm not too concerned if they trade queens. Like, the extra space does give you a pretty, pretty pleasant position here. So that's really detailing how to play e5. Advanced players will probably want to look into knight f3 and, you know, sort of dive deeper into how these positions play out. But for most of you, are not going to face knight f3 much in your game, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Unless you're, like, already playing in feed array tournaments on a regular basis. Then you might want to have a, a look for this a bit more detail in your own time. But moving on, also, you might be wondering, well, since c4 is well met by e5, well, what if white plays knight f3 and then plays the move c4? In this case, there are quite a few reasonable options at black's disposal. I sort of experiment with a lot of different moves here as black. The most standard one here is probably just to play knight f6, and, you know, if they play c4, kind of transpose back into a, a king's Indian defense. Uh, to be fair, you're not forced to transpose. You do have a creative alternative of bishop to f5, known as a Janowski variation, where you sort of make it harder for white to get in the move e4 before continuing with your normal sort of king's Indian plans. Um, There's more of a high-level system, but it is something that could surprise your opponents and can be a way for you to get king's Indian type positions, but without having to study a whole lot of theory. Uh, also, you know, after knight f6, it's true that there are also some creative options where, for example, after bishop f4, the move knight h5 can be kind of a fun way to mess up somebody's l normal London setup. Because if they play bishop g5, you can sort of kick their bishop. And it's kind of a nice point that this position here is actually already better for black. Even though your setup looks a bit weird, you're able to win the bishop pair and you just have this really flexible setup where it's quite hard for white to find a good middle game plan somehow. Um, so that can be a little nice resource for those who want to play creatively and you know, don't just want to transpose into King's Indian. Um, I've also played Bishop G4. It's another way to you know get a creative position where you you know just avoid fury and just play chess. Uh, also, Bishop G5 kind of fun as well to go Knight D7 and kind of go for this similar idea of chasing their bishop with H6 and G5. So you can see, even when we play Knight F6, there are still some ways we can play where we can avoid Fury and still get a playable position. But there's also other options like G6, where, you know, the option's always there to transpose back into the modern defense with Bishop to G7. Uh, I'm not going to focus too much on this, just because I've already covered this in a lot of detail in a course of mine play G6 like Hikaru, where I'd kind of be repeating myself. Although, to be fair, in that course, I mainly focused on the move Knight C6. Whereas, it's worth pointing out, there are other approaches as well, like you can play... For example, bishop to g4 and you know, put pressure on the d4 pawn this way. You know, this is definitely a you know a very legitimate plan for black, where you don't have to learn too much fury, but you do get a, a playable position. Uh, another option also can be just to go knight d7 and just play e5. And actually, it's something I was doing in Tile Tuesday, I think a month or two ago, where you know the normal approach is just knight f6 and transposing into the 
the classical King's Indian, where it is true you did avoid some things like the same-ish, the atrium of Togonov. So if you like the King's Indian, this can be one way to, you know, to move order your opponent a little bit into the classical and reduce your workload a little bit. But I was also playing the system with C6 and, you know, Knight 8 6 is one that I like to play a bit in 2005. And, you know, the engines kind of hate it, but if you want to avoid fear at all costs and get an interesting strategic battle, this is, is one way you can do so. Um, it is true if you play Knight 6 and melee H4, H5, it does become a little bit of a problem. So, you know, so there are some issues like that to consider when choosing your move orders in these light openings. But yeah, those just to give you an idea of some of the options within G6. Uh, another option is also the weight defense with Bishop G4, which can end up being quite similar actually to the line I showed with the, the check defense earlier. Like if they go E4, you could even see how this can, you know, potentially transpose in fact to this, uh, to this system as such. Also, there are other moves they can play, like they can go Knight BD2 to avoid the double pawns. But then I find like knight f6, like the same sub still works quite well. Uh, also worth pointing out in these quieter subs, you can even consider knight d7 and you know putting the pawn on e5 instead for a bit more of an active sub with a bit less of a theoretical workload by comparison. Uh, in terms of any other options, I mean those are sort of the main ideas, like you're often just going to play like knight d7, knight f6, push the e pawn, bishop e7 castles, and you, know, you kind of just play chess from there, uh, where you know the better player is going to win. And I have 100% score from this position as black, which, yeah, tells you I was the, the better player in those games. The other final options I'll mention, like, if you do play the Leningrad Dutch, you can go for the F5 move order, and there are technically some disadvantages, like, Knight C3 is kind of an annoying system, which, you know, if you're playing some master level, you're probably not going to be able to get away with this. But against players like amateurs, you probably can get away with, you know, playing something like this and, you know, just sort of playing chess in a way. So, so you can see a lot of different a lot of different ways you can play after d6 and you know it may well happen that you already play a system that you can transpose back into via d6. Or you get some extra options say against c4 against knight f3 that you can play when you want to avoid a theoretical battle or just play a little bit more creatively in general. If they do play e3, I normally just play the move e5 and you know, knight f3. I'm fairly happy just to get a space advantage and you know just develop the the king side in this sort of way. One point I will mention, there are a lot of moves you can play from this position. You don't really need to know a whole lot of theory. But one of my own personal favorites, which is not quite as common, is this move of c5 is kind of a nice way to sort of get a nice space advantage where you know you still develop normally, but if they do play a move like d5, you kind of get the e5 square for your knights. Whereas they don't have d4 for their knight by comparison, because we're covering it with the pawn. Finally, if they do play something like bishop to f4 here, there's a lot of decent options available for black at this point. Um, I mean, yeah, you can definitely play like g6 and you know, head in the spirit of the play for g6 like Hikaru repertoire. You know, going for like knight d7 and the move e5 is, is a nice little setup to you know, attack their bishop a bit faster than usual. Uh, actually, Ray Robson in a game against me played knight c6 and you know, managed to beat me with this move. So it's something you might also explore as a possible alternative to the play G6 like Ikaru repertoire. Uh, you can also play other moves, like definitely one more creative one I've been experimenting with lately has been Bishop to F5 and just going for E5. Probably objectively speaking, it's not the best because Knight C3 and E4, like this sort of thing does prove to be a bit annoying. But if your opponent doesn't know it, then Bishop F5 is a way to kind of get a you know sort of creative position without too much theory to it. Uh, so... Anyway, that's sort of the main ideas really for d4, d6, and I guess the final thing to point out is that yes, you can also play it after knight f3, c4, and the flank openings as well. Uh, for example, they play c4, very e5, and and I find this Grand Prix style attack with like knight f6, bishop e7 castles just works really well against nearly all of the flank openings. Like you just get this standard e4, and, and this very nice space and center advantage in the center when they do play d4. And if they play something like g3, it's again a similar story. You go e5, bishop g2. And you know, just get very familiar positions, bishop e7, castles. And uh, also a nice point that I learned from uh, Cyrus Lakdawala's great book on 1d6 is that if they do play a standard kings in the attack with e4, this is just really very pleasant for black. 
where you can go knight c6 and it's pleasant because you already have pressure against e4 pawn you already have a very easy plan of attacking on the king side and it's very tough for white to really come up with a good middle game plan in this sort of structure where the pawns are a little bit blocked in at the moment finally if they do play c4 yeah once again you can go d6 and if they do play it in english style with g3 yeah once again f5 this stuff I actually taught in my group coaching program while I was still running last year about how against the English you could really just play this setup against virtually anything that White does and get quite a reasonable position. For those who are not so familiar with the Grand Prix attack, the main plan here is to go Queen e8, Queen h5, and just basically throw all the pieces of the White King. That being said, computers do point out this is probably objectively not the, the best plan. So as you get a bit more advanced, you might like to play some other options like for example c6 and go for a plan like h6 bishop e6 knight d7 and kind of play it like a big clamp where you're trying to prepare the d5 break of course white can also play on the queen side you know white definitely has his chances as well and may even be a little bit better with best play here but it's certainly a very playable option for black we're able to avoid having to study any fury and play more using ideas rather than strict uh, memorization as such uh, of course, they play e3, kind of similar story, you know. But in any case, that's, yeah, I think, a pretty good summary of the different options you can play with d6 after the different first moves. Of course, they play g3, e3, b3, f4. You can do it for the similar stuff against virtually all of this, you know, b3, d6. I will say in this version, you probably don't want to play f5 in this version. You might prefer to play maybe bishop e7 and, you know, maybe wait for him to play like knight f3 and maybe then play f5, you know, when you're gaining a, a tempo on the knight it really does kind of make a difference here. Um, but the point remains, you know, this is a general sub that will work the majority of the time against white's alternatives. And yeah, I wish you the best of luck playing d6 in your own games. There's a little bit of a different format for the video, but I do hope that you, uh, you enjoyed it. Also, let me know in the, the comments below, what's the way that you like to play d6 most as black which of these options that i showed you was the the most appealing to you so let me know that in the comments and i will see you guys in the next one take care